Hi, this is Bernie Worrell, and you are listening to Retrospectives with John Broughton on KC Radio 97.7 FM. Keep the funk alive, Australia. Be well. Well, just go back to your childhood for a moment. Um, your beginnings were in classical piano. Is, is that a music form that you still have a spot for, a soft spot for to this day? It's not a soft spot. I, I spot it where I want. <laughs> it's, it's not a spot. It's, music is my soft spot, yeah. not just classical. So I put, I, I interject it, put it where, where it comes, where, where, however it comes. I'm a channel. It comes through me from God, and and I mix all music. But just looking back, how much do you think that early classical um, education you got influenced the music that you went on to play in later years? Well, I, I would say 75% because I was trained in the rudiments and chordal structure and the harmony and theory from an early age. So in the classical realm, so with rock and R&B or reggae and Jewish chants, Irish ditties, every, I understand everything. And I guess that's how I can mix everything together. You were well educated in, in music growing up. During that time, were you already thinking beyond the boundaries musically from what was being taught to you? I, I don't know if I was thinking about it, but I'm a rebel, and, and I'll be free. And I'll play what I want. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't necessarily think about anything. You know, I just play. Yeah. H- how do you look back on those early years in, in Boston playing the nightclubs there in terms of your grounding as a musician? How, how, say that again. How do I? Those early years in Boston, how do you look back on those now in terms of uh, your grounding as a, as a musician? I, I loved it. That. Like you said, that's the groundwork. And I like playing with people. I like teamwork. And I like I like um, variety. So you had, <clears throat> when I was part of the house band <clears throat> in Boston, it was a review. You had dancers, then you had the comedian, and then you had the artist, whoever the club was bringing in for that weekend. Uh-huh. Who, so, uh, who were some sorry. of your, who were some of your contemporaries on on that scene back in Boston? Okay, well, you can go from I got I had the honor to meet Pigmeat Markham and Baby Seals, uh, which were idols, uh, big time um, predecessors of of uh, today's. Comedians, Moms Mabley, I met her. Dionne Warwick, Tammy Terrell, who you might, well, it was Tammy Montgomery then, but Tammy Terrell, who did a lot of duos uh, with Marvin Gaye, Lola Falana, um, Freddie Scott, and then, then there's a Tommy Hunt, these are all big R and B. Yeah, oh, they're great. They're great names, aren't they? Chuck Jackson. Do you recall? Uh, do you have memories of your first meeting with George Clinton? In the barber shop. <laughs> <laughs> was it really? Yes, because I was brought up real strict and couldn't hang with the hoodlums, like my mama would say. So I used to sneak out of my bedroom and to go down to the barbershop to get my hair processed. And uh, when my parents first moved to Plainfield, New Jersey, which is the home of P-Funk, uh, I guess the word spread that this new kid moved to town and he's supposed to be some... I can't say the word genius. I, I, I'm, I'm the humble type. I don't talk about myself. But that the word was, they used the genius word, I guess, or somebody special. And uh, 
I had heard of uh, Parliament. It was Parliament at the time. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I wanted to hang out, but I couldn't so because I was, wasn't allowed to. So I uh, would sneak out. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd just go down to the barbershop and get my hair done and... Um, you know, try to be a, a, a part of. I was a nerd until my mother would come down and sw- switch me out of the, bar- the barber's chair and switch switch George also. <laughs> 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 and from that, the, the, you know, that that was heaven for me. Getting ready to get get being able to hang with, you know, other people. Mm. Um, and that's why I've got to be free today. I will be free and, and do what I want. When, go ahead. When you first joined the band, were you clearly informed as to what they expected you to bring to the group musically, or were you given a license to, to pretty much show your own initiatives there? I do what I want. Yeah. Uh, they made me bet. Uh, they didn't make me, but I became band leader, m- musical director, and uh, well, the rest is history. Sure is. Because I was the one with the education, so to speak, but that's it in that realm. But there was also education I received from the street, from, from Eddie Hazel and Billy Nelson, Tal Ross, who were lived in the projects. That's the real funk. Is there one particular Funkadelic album that for you really hits the nail on the head showing the, the pure essence of what the band was about? No, there's no favorites. People ask me, what you, who's your favorite keyboarder, your favorite this? There are no favorites. There's a few favorites. <laughs> <laughs> so I like Chocolate City. I like America Eats Us Young. I like songs of Funkenstein. I like that, you know, you know a little bit of, of something in all of them. Yeah. And then some I don't like in, in all of them. But it's not about like or dislike. I just, you know, somebody, if I don't like it, so what? So somebody else will like it. That's right. That's right. It's all subjective. Uh, by the time you left the band in the early 80s, did you have a, a pretty clear vision at that time what you wanted to do with the next stage of your career? No, I don't have busy. I don't think about what I want to do. <laughs> I just do as it comes. I, I don't. That's not me. I just take it as it comes, as it's sent to me. Mm. I'm not going to plan anything or projection that can lead to disappointment, like expectations. Somebody expects something of you. But if, what if you don't get it? it you disappointed, not me. Yeah. That, that no one told you to expect. <laughs> that goes for for uh, anything. You had expectations. If somebody gave so if you, it doesn't th- work out. Then who gets? Oh, then all, everybody's all. Bleh, 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 bleh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't tell you expect. If if you had the task of having to write a, a dictionary definition of funk, how, how would you describe it? Oh, I get this. I don't know what it is. It's a, it's a feel. My answer is it's a feel, uh, a vibe, a feeling. I, 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 it's it's rhythmic. It's organic. It makes you dance. Makes you want to do a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps it's something it's best not to analyze. No, just let it come. Let it flow. Yeah. James Brown, everybody gets up it. No matter where you are worldwide, you put on James James Brown music, everybody's up and dancing. Exactly. You could put up other funk uh, personnel or whatever. Some will dance and then sometimes not. But James Brown comes on. I mean, I've seen it. I've witnessed it myself. We used to talk about that. Anytime James is on, and it's not just James, it's the ensemble. 
<laughs> yeah. it's, it's just something about it. Something about the music. You want to make me dance. <laughs> <laughs> you've, ne- you've never been one to stand still musically. You played in a, in a multitude of different styles and, and genres. Did you get a little restless at times playing in the one style for too long? Yeah, I get bored quick. Yeah? Okay, been there, done that. Next. <laughs> Variety. So you think it's pretty. Spice. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think it's an important part of being a successful musician to be open-minded to a variety of styles and, and to sometimes go outside of your, your comfort zone? Well, I'm I'm comfortable as long as I'm playing. That depends on the person. Um, I can That depends on the individual. Some. I can't. We're all made differently and wired differently. So, just be happy. Mm-hmm. Be happy with what you're doing and having fun. <clears throat> First of all, if you can't have fun, then it's not worth it. Playing on the the Talking Heads uh, <coughs> tour must have been an exciting time for you, especially the the Stop Making Sense tour. It seemed like it's such an exciting event to be part of. Any standout memories of that? Oh yeah. <laughs> First of all, they, they're p funk fans, and I was br- able to bring to bring to the group uh, not just my playing and everything, but Lynn Mabry as background vocalist, one of the background vocalists uh, from the Brides of Frankenstein. There's Nona Hendrix there. Steve Scales, percussionist, mm-hmm. uh, who played with uh, Tina Turner, Buster Jones, Adrian Ballou, uh, funk meisters, funk and rock and whatever meisters, R and B meister, Buster Jones on bass, which helped who helped Tina immensely with her feel and her rhythm. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, well, we all added the rhythm. We, you know what's up. They knew what was up. They were P-Funk fans. So. I believe, though, that when you were approached to, to work with Talking Head, you, were, you weren't too familiar with, with the band and, and their music. What is that right? I didn't know. I, right. I, I received a phone call from Jerry Harrison asking me if I'd be interested in joining. And I said, well, who are you? Because I didn't follow New Wave. And <laughs> uh, Jerry and I still laugh about that now, because he's one real, real, very close. And uh, then they invited me to the studio in New York to hang out, and I went and listened to some of this stuff, and we jammed a little, a little bit, and discovered that they were kind of the same way P-Funk does in the studio. Mm-hmm. And I liked what I heard and felt and I interjected what I do which they knew already I guess that's it. and well, the rest is history. It sure is. You've worked with so many other amazing names through the years. Uh, two that jump out to me are Keith Richards and Jack Bruce. Any um any particular memories of uh, working with those guys? I love my brothers. I miss Jack. Yeah, I miss him. Yeah. Ginger, yeah. that was a trip. Because I worked close with Jack for many years, and then Bill Laswell brought Ginger into the picture, and I <laughs> got to see the history that they made before between the two of them. <laughs> and I, brought, I, I brought Gary Mudbone Cooper from Bootsy Rubber Band in, and so I was, Bill asked me in Mudbone to, I had to babysit Jack. No, no, I babysit sat Ginger, and Mudbone babysat Jack. <laughs> keeping them apart. <laughs> but was, but those are special moments. They, they, they've had a fiery relationship at times, haven't they, Jack and Ginger? Oh, yes. Uh, I had heard about it, but then I, then I got to see it. <laughs> <laughs> but Jack and I 
I had worked with Jack before, and you know, without Ginger, then all of a sudden they're brought together. <laughs> <laughs> and Keith Richards? My baby, my brother. I love him, deep respect. Um, yeah, Keith. Um, Keith played after I recorded on his al- his solo album and did two video shoots with Sarah Dash, part of the band. Also, I asked Keith if he would play a song on play on a song on my solo album that I was doing at the time. And he says, yeah, burn it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Came over, um, played for free. And after he played on the one song, he asked me, hey, Bernie, what, what, got, what else you got? Give me something else. He played on another song. Then the next day, his manager called and said, Keith was so excited and so happy. He said, it's the most fun he's had in, in a while. So... That was special. Yeah. Are there any particular artists uh, that you haven't collaborated with as yet that you still harbor a desire to, to work with one day? A lot of them have uh, the passed. Jimmy Hendrix. <laughs> yeah. Bob Marley. But uh, t- today, I don't, I don't know, because I don't keep up with, with uh, who's out there. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, Dumpster Funk with my, Ivan Neville. I've sat in with them before, and you know, I can't really say if, if they make a call and, uh, and ask me. Yeah, but I don't keep up with what's going on in this program radio stuff because I don't listen to it. Yeah, and I. I- I know you don't like to choose favorites, but if there's one particular recording session that you will always take with you as a, a proudest moment, could are you able to name one? Chocolate City. Ah. <laughs> I, I love the theme that George came up with. And that was a melding of the jazz style and classical style on... The uh, writing material, the, the, you know, with the baby grand piano, which I love playing. So I, I like switch from one to the other. Yeah. But I, but I get bored. I sit in, and I, I, I'm known for my layering. So I layer layer sounds. I deal with sound, not words. You can keep your words. I, you know, I, I play to the words, or the words play to me. <laughs> um, I deal with sound notes. Yeah. Um, flashlight. Yeah. <laughs> that was that. That was a, a fluke. Really? Yeah, because it just happened. Uh, the Bootsy came to George and <clears throat> with a track. It was only drums and. Uh, a rhythm guitar he didn't want the track so he gave it to George so I built I built the whole thing around the drum pattern and the rhythm guitar and everything else is me on there there's three four synthesizers vocals and the saxophone solo I believe the the management and business side of the the music industry has not always been a, a happy aspect for you. Has it been hard at times to to shut that side of the industry uh, out of your mind and just be able to focus on the music? Can it be a distraction at times? Well, I don't do the management. <laughs> I don't do. That. There, there were uh, <clears throat> some people that managed before my wife, Judy. Judy's manager now. Yeah. After she busted the other people with stealing money, whatnot, so I don't, I can't deal with that. Yeah, it, it could be a major distraction, I would imagine. Yeah, if somebody be hurt, <laughs> <I'll> be. <laughs> <laughs> 
over the years, you would have seen many advances in, in technology and music. Do you think all these advances have been necessar- necessarily for the better, in, in your opinion? I can't. I can't say if it's it's not for the better because the kids are not learning the rudiments, the basics. Which, in a lot of most of my interviews, when they ask me that, what I want, what do I want to say to the kids? I say, hands on, hands on the instrument, not pushing a button. I mean, this is the technology, so that's what's up. And they're they're creating that way. But think of what they could do if they knew the root of instrument basics and had hands on whatever instrument they choose. Right. So they could learn learn so much more and create so much more. That would be the best piece of career advice you could give to a budding musician. Keep it all hands on. Yes, but but then you can't keep it all because you have to go with the sign with the times, and mm. that's what time it is now. It's going to probably change even more. And I don't know where it's going to change because everybody's taking music programs out of the schools. I don't know what that's about. That's crazy. Yeah, that that's a major worry, isn't it? Yes, it, it's that's devilish. Tell us, you know what tell, I mean? Yeah. <laughs> tell us about your current uh, band, the Bernie Worrell Orchestra, and the makeup of the guys in that band. Uh, <clears throat> it's a nine-piece, three horns, uh, two guitars, bass, percussion, drums, and myself. We have two different configurations, sometimes three different, because all of the horn players can't make it all, all of the time. So sometimes we play with five-piece, six-piece, and then a lot of guests are disappearing but with each configuration everybody the audience and the club owners like it love it and always ask us back wherever we play um, all, all the musicians are younger than me which is good because they got the energy <laughs> <laughs> but one of the important things is they they are all well-rounded. They can play any type of music. It's which, if that's what I do. Yeah. And they, the listeners, and which is another part uh, uh, aspect that I tell the youngsters, you have to listen. It's not just about you, or about I, me, I, I, me, me. A band is a band. It's it's a team. Whether you're playing in your own band or sitting in with somebody or recording, you have to listen. Absolutely. And listening is, I would say, the most, one of the most important aspects of playing and performing. Um, the other thing is the guys, the youngsters, my nephews. <laughs> In the band that they all teach, yeah, our oh, students. Yeah. One is a, a uh, he has his own recording studio, does outside projects. The percussionist has been with the Lion King on Broadway for 15 years. He's close to my age, and uh, it's a well-rounded group. And they listen, and, and they're all creative. And they are young. <laughs> Fantastic. And just before I let you go, Bernie, upcoming plans. What what what's in your books for uh, the the near future? I don't know. I don't think about that. Just whatever God sends. <laughs> I don't. You, you know, whatever comes. Uh, there's a Japanese CD that I did. I think three or four, maybe four years ago, of all melodicas. Oh, wow. And that that's, uh, we just saw the artwork. That's coming up soon in Japan. There's a Bill Lazro Warrell production 
another solo CD of just me and Baby Grand Piano. Uh, uh, so some, hopefully sometime in the fall or winter, that'll be out. Uh, that, that has Japanese backing also. Bill's been had to move, and if you know, moving in New York, and he has a son now. It's been kind of hectic for him. Also, do projects with Bill Laswell and DJ Crush uh, from Japan. Uh, we play Italy a lot, and then I also do a. Um, guest appearance me myself and Fred Wesley with Leo Nocentelli from the Meters oh yeah uh, it, we're working on a co-billing of beat Bernie Warrell Orchestra and Leo Nocentelli with Fred um, like co-billing and touring wow and I, I also play with Steve Kimmock I mean, I'm not with the BWO, I'm with Steve Kimmock, uh, who we were introduced by his son, John Kimmock, and George Porter from the Meters. And that's like two peas in a pod. I get, in, <laughs> I get, in, get inspired by Steve. So I've been with Steve for about two years, and, and we're finishing up his album. So when I'm not with BWR, I'm with Steve and the other outside projects. Wow. Well, as always, keeping very busy, which is <laughs> fantastic yeah. for us. Hey, Bernie, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute honor to, to speak with you, and thank you for your contribution to some uh, wonderful music over the years. Wait, wait, would you please do us a favor? Would you, would, yeah. Would you try to get the BWO over to Australia oh. and New Zealand, where, where, wherever that would be wonderful. We, we would love to see you. If you have any contacts, or just spread the word. Yeah. Bring us. Bring <laughs> us, please. <laughs> oh, we're here waiting for you. I'll see if I can send some contact information over, over to you. Yeah, I think Judy was going to ask you yep. for some. And the, the, uh, one thing, the Jerry Harrison and I do, we're close. And every time I'm on the West Coast, uh, Jerry sits in with whoever I'm playing with and we just did a thing in California, and it was sold out. People around the, the corner. And Blackberry McKnight from P-Funk loves BWO, and he comes and sits in with us uh, whenever we're in on the West Coast, close to his hometown. Oh, that's sensational. It's great to have a ne network of uh, wonderful friends, friends and musicians all over the place. Yeah, that's yes. great. Great. Thanks again, Bernie. You take right, care. Thank you. And we'll stay in touch. Thank you so much, and God bless. You too. All the best. Thank you. Bye-bye.